Okay, um, so what we've been doing so far for the one hour we had together on Tuesday is to look at the Roman British background to medieval Britain and Ireland and primarily so far I did a kind of very rough chronological sketch of the development of the Roman power, Roman power in Britain between the time of Claudius's invasion and the supposed end of Roman rule at the beginning of the 5th century, sometime around about 409, 410, as I said, the date's given. What we'll do in this hour is take a more thematic look at some aspects of life in Roman Britain and uh, the organisation of Roman Britain. And then in the second hour, we shall look at the Vindolanda tablets, the photocopies I gave you to read and look at them as documents and look at them in the light of the things we've been discussing and so on. And since we don't have a presentation for this topic, because it's the first topic and I guess no one wished to volunteer and so on, we'll see if we may finish a bit early. I don't know. I can't promise that, of course, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, a map, or a series of maps, I should say, showing the development kind of administratively of Roman power in Britain uh, from the uh, first century down to the beginning of the fourth century and the gradual division of the province of Britannia into more than uh, one part. So in this first map, it's the situation that we were discussing right at the beginning of our chronology. This is uh, the early conquest by the Romans uh, these areas here and these two extra lines here indicate client kingdoms, kingdoms which were paying tribute and recognized Roman power but still had their own independent king. So Britannia proper uh, was here and didn't include these two though within a generation or so they were uh, a few years they were absorbed into uh, British rule. Here's the situation uh, round about 100, beginning of the second century, okay, uh, as we said, for a while we have the Antonine uh, Wall up here into Scotland, but eventually, as you can see, the traditional boundary back to Hadrian's Wall uh, is pulled back. So um, this situation moved this way briefly, then we moved back there. And as you can see, at the beginning, the Romans were based at Colchester, but shortly thereafter they shifted to London. London becomes the provincial capital, the capital of the province of Britannia. In 197, under the Emperor Septimus Severus, it was deemed necessary to divide Britannia into two separate provinces. So now we have in the south Britannia Superior and in the north Britannia Inferior. London remains the capital of Britannia Superior and Britannia Inferior was uh, governed from York, originally been a, a legionary fortress there and now becomes the provincial capital for Britannia Inferior. And then, as I think we mentioned the other day, sometime round about these dates, I think, uh, these two regions are further subdivided into, in the south, Britannia Superior becomes Britannia Prima. Can you read these? The letters are getting a bit small now. Let me write these up. Might be the best thing. I'll write them up on here. It's a bit clearer. So, Brit Sup becomes... Britannia Prima and uh, no. Maxima Caesariensis. So this is Britannia Prima based at Sirencester, and London again remains the capital for Maxima Caesarensensis. And Britannia Inferior becomes. Britannia Secunda, up here. Uh, 
which is based at York, and remind myself of the name, Flavia. Flavia Caesariensis in the southern region, based at Lincoln. So during this period, as Roman power in Britain extends, and as Romanization of the native population becomes more extensive, I suppose. Uh, so originally we had a small province, and then we had um, uh, outside of Roman power here. Then we have a little later the Roman province, but with the civilian zone and then the more military zone in northern England, northern Wales. As that situation shifts and we get a greater degree of Romanization and Roman power, and uh, they decide to divide and then subdivide the um, provinces up. A province traditionally under the control of a governor who was responsible obviously ultimately to the uh, emperor and he will have had his base at London or uh, one of the other capitals depending on the situation we're at. And uh, in the case of Britain, because it had what they call an active uh, border, because it bounded onto regions which were outside the empire, uh, his role was both administrative but also to some extent military. And we saw, for example, the case of Agricola uh, at the end of the first century, one of the uh, more well-known British governors uh, was uh, famous for his military conquests and extending Roman power, uh, creating this kind of situation here, as we said. So um, the governor was both a military leader as well as an, an administrator. Okay, any questions on that? Any thoughts there? Okay, I want to shift now. Let me just see what we've got next. Okay, let's say a little bit about this screen. Okay, Uzke? How, uh, how were they able to control uh, Britannia? I uh, mean, Roman speakers, because they were Roman speakers, and they were the organization uh, people were uh, migrating there and uh, um, uh, producing some structures, political structures? Okay, well, this, this, this screen will actually partly answer your question, I suppose, okay? Because you can say, we control this area, and here we are dividing it up, or whatever, which we've just described, but you're saying, how do they make that work? How do they actually uh, control that? So, okay, various things that they can do, both in a sort of physical, but also in a more, perhaps, more cultural way. And so we'll perhaps explore some of these uh, for the rest of this hour, in a sense. And if, the, if we haven't answered your question fully, then please uh, remind me, and so on. Um, so one of the things, one of the ways in which Romans uh, imposed their power was obviously through military uh, uh, imposition, uh, okay, by having a military presence, and that's an obvious way that any conqueror will consolidate uh, their position after having a, a claim to have defeated uh, a rival army or something and then claiming to rule that area, you need then to uh, spread your power uh, around and spread your armies around. So. Um, the third bullet here is the part answer to that. They would build fortresses uh, in different parts of the country. And as they spread their power further north, the fortresses primarily were uh, the bulwark of that spread of their power. Um, but the other uh, two kinds of uh, urban unit are also very important. So uh, they'll partly answer the question as well. The native Britons, the... Uh, Celtic speaking occupants of Britain prior to the Roman uh, uh, conquest uh, were not a particularly urban people. They didn't have uh, large urban settlements in which they uh, lived together. And the same is true of their uh, Irish cousins across the Irish Sea as well. The um, peoples of Iron Age Europe in general did not have large uh, towns, as we would call them, uh, where they were based. The Romans introduced uh, urbanism in that sense. The Britons had, remember we mentioned this last week uh, on Tuesday, uh, in some parts of uh, Britain, they had central places, opida, opidum, in the singular, which acted as both kind of economic and political and military centers, I suppose, for their tribal regions. 
And in other, where, in other places, they had hill forts. They had fortified settlements on top of uh, tall hills, which commanded a certain con control over a certain region. Um, but they did not have large-scale uh, towns which acted both in an administrative, uh, commercial, uh, and economic way in the way that modern towns or Roman towns did. So urbanism, in our sense of the word, uh, primarily comes in with the Romans. Okay? And many towns and cities in Britain today owe their origin uh, partly to uh, a Roman presence and so on. So here, in a kind of slightly simplified way, we can talk about three kinds of urban unit in uh, the Roman world. Uh, the coloniae, uh, the civitates, or civit it should be civitas capitals, that should be, and then as I said a minute ago, the fortresses as well. Uh, colo a colonia, which is where we get the English word colony from, of course, uh, is a kind of created a new settlement, and that's what the English word means still today. You, you set up a colony in a new place or something. And very many of the uh, coloniae in the Roman uh, Empire were set up uh, often uh, using veterans, retired uh, soldiers, Roman soldiers. Okay, So they were kind of imposed upon the native population. But to go to Erzge's point before, um, the Roman conquest uh, and rule in Britain did not see, as far as we can tell, a large-scale demographic movement. Demographic, demography means population. population. Okay, So we do not see a large amount of settlement in Britain by people from Italy or other parts of the Roman world. There were, obviously, uh, people uh, settling in, but by and large, uh, the population remained relatively stable. It continued to be the native Britons. They just became Romanized rather than Romans coming in. But uh, there were outsiders, foreigners coming in, and these veterans, the soldiers who perhaps in some cases had been fighting in Britain, and in other cases from elsewhere perhaps, uh, formed the core initial population for a new colony. Okay? And I mentioned, I think, Colchester the other day uh, as one of the early examples of this causing some trouble with the native Britons and other important uh, colonies uh, include Lincoln and Gloucester. Lincoln is here and more importantly perhaps for our purposes and I'll have to shift again is were the civitates, civitates, depending on how you wish to pronounce this. Let me push this up a bit, and then you can even see here it says the civitates of Roman Britain in the second century. So this is the situation when they'd expanded and had military power up to about here, um, but the main area was down here for the uh, uh, civil uh, zone. So this is the kind of administrative breakup of the areas that the Romans were ruling fairly directly and didn't feel they needed to uh, primarily control militarily. Okay? And these are the boundaries uh, with their names, as they are often called. And what these were, to a large extent, were just versions of the earlier tribal units, the old tribal groupings, pre-Roman tribal uh, groupings uh, taken over and given some kind of a boundary and then administered by the Romans themselves. Okay, so the names you can see here are the names of the native populations. And, um, and now it's not so clear in this example, unfortunately, but the circles, so for example here, this is Leicester, is uh, the capital of this particular uh, civitas, this is the civitas or civitas capital, uh, and this one, Lincoln here, is a fortress, probably, or it's a co sorry, a, co a colony, as we mentioned before. Okay, Colonia. Uh, Roxeter here is another one. But unfortunately, because of the map, as far as I can see, it's hard to distinguish. Maybe if you go further back, it's a bit easier. The, so the round ones mark the Civitas capitals, and the square ones, sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't, mark the uh, co colonies, the uh, uh, earlier settlements, and so on. So... 
this is the kind of subdivision of how they organize things. And these uh, Kivitas capitals were often, not always, but were often based on the previous oppidum of a particular Kivitas. So they would build actually on top of or very close to the previous British settlement. Uh, this imposes a certain degree of continuity, I suppose. It helps the Romans to uh, encourage the British to feel that there's a continuity of, of power and so on. Uh, and it helps them to impose their power in that sense. Many, most of these towns have been excavated, if they're uh, not perfectly, of course, because there's usually a modern city or town on top of them. And if they can find a forum and a basilica in the town, then that usually indicates this Kivitas capital status. It's an archaeological indicator of the, the status of uh, the town. And, as we said before, fortresses. The Romans, obviously, occupied Britain militarily. They were a, uh, initially an invading force, and initially, obviously, not very welcome for most Britons. And the, they had, as we saw, to face a number of uh, rebellions during the first century that we discussed last time. So uh, they didn't entirely impose their power perfectly at the start. So, as I said, one of the ways to uh, enforce your presence and uh, consolidate your power is to build fortresses, uh, particularly in the, uh, as we see in the, in the military zones where you still don't have perfect power, we see the imposition of uh, fortresses. Fortresses varied from big legionary fortresses that had a particular Roman legion based there to auxiliary fortresses which were far more smaller concerns. And I think Vindolanda, the fort, fortress at Vindolanda, was an, had an auxiliary status. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Okay. What happens is around these fortresses you sometimes get uh, suburban settlement. You get um, a small uh, sometimes called in Latin the vicus, building up outside the walls of the fortress. Uh, why would that be? Why would you get a small settlement building up outside the fortress? What would be the reason for that? Yeah, okay, that's one option. Okay, to, If there is any need to uh, be defended, you could just run through the door and close the, the, uh, the door and be protected inside. Other, re other reasons? The fortress itself obviously uh, contained a reasonably sized and mixed population, soldiers, but as we'll see from the Vindolanda tablets, a whole set of other people as well. And they had their own economic, personal, cultural needs and so on. So um, traders and other people would find it uh, a good idea to settle close to or even against the wall, near, very near the walls of the um, uh, 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 fortress in order to um, have access, ready access for whatever needs they might have. So for example this picture here I found on the web, uh, this is Diva which is now the city of Chester which is very close to where I come from, in fact just over the border from Wales and here you can see this is the wall, this is a reconstruction. Here is the wall of the fortress but here is presumably this degree of suburban development. Okay, uh, The River Dee was far more navigable then than it is today, I think, and so it was quite an important uh, sort of port site as well, not just contact over land and so on. So a fort, but it has uh, more than just a military role uh, as, they, as they develop, and obviously uh, as, as uh, Northern England becomes more Romanized, then the role of Chester uh, varies to some extent. Let's put a map up, see if we can make some, under, have some understanding, some understanding of this. As long as we've got the key. Okay, let's look at this one together then. So this should be a slightly clearer, I think. Here are 
different kinds of uh, town in Roman Britain uh, with the key at the bottom. We won't go into all of these in detail. Here the square indicates the Civitas capital. Okay. In the case of London here you see the provincial capital okay, before York uh, succeeded to that status as well. Um, Colonia is the half one. Let's find where's one here. Okay. And so on. Now, looking at this map together, uh, okay, so it's a nice patchwork of dots and squares and so on, but what else, what do you think this can see? People have obviously worked very hard uh, to identify Roman towns from the small number of printed documents and then from archaeological finds as well. What does this distribution map, do you think, reveal, apart from obviously uh, where the towns in Britain were, but uh, uh, what, what perhaps interesting patterns emerge here? Can you see anything? You can tell that the, the military sites are located <laughs> further north. So probably less controlled area. Well, yes, okay, we've got... Uh, Military small towns further up the north. Uh, sorry? Yeah, so there's a, like the small defended sites as well as the military small towns. There's only a few in the, in the south. And yeah, the more up here and so on, yes. We have a few industrial small towns there, I think, don't we? And then we have a few more uh, sites up there. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, overall, I mean, look look at Wales doesn't have anything apart from a couple of sites in the south and the northern part of England. You can see it's definitely much thinner up there. The bigger concentration is kind of here, with then a reasonable amount of sites here. But a lot of these are these defended sites rather than um, kind of commercial ones. And we've seen that the uh, military zone pushing up here and here, whereas the civilian civil zone down here. So uh, the degree of urbanization is clearly kind of following uh, Roman, the degree of Roman uh, power, direct Roman power in Britain in that sense. Okay. Uh, so the north was always a little bit outside the direct control, uh, particularly in the early uh, first century or so, and this urban uh, pattern uh, to some extent reflects that, I think. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? That was the main thing I wished to point out, I suppose. Um, so, let's look at a different aspect of life, which is um, rural organization. Uh, here in a very, very simple way, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at things, but here we can break things down again into perhaps uh, even simpler into two ways, the, what we call villas and what we call native settlements. Roman villas, that by definition tells us a little bit about what we think of these things, and uh, the native settlements uh, elsewhere. Now I've got another map. Okay, this is, uh, I'll read what it says here and then we'll uh, see what we can interpret from this one. Comparison of the distribution of villas constructed before AD 100, uh, western slash northern boundary of counties containing pre-100 villas shown as dashed line, uh, with that of coins of the 
Cantovalonian, uh, Trinovantian rulers of the late Iron Age. Stipple indicates ca these counties. So this line here is the border within which, on this side, um, archaeologists have found villas which um, probably date before 100, so were created within the first 50, 60 years of Roman presence in Britain. And the dotted area indicates places where coins from the pre-Roman uh, rulers of the Cantavalonian and Trinovantian tribes, who are kind of based around this region primarily, uh, have been found. Okay, the rulers uh, minted their own coins, partly imitating the Romans. Now, villas were rural and agricultural settlements um, common in the Roman Empire. Uh, they could be a settlement as the center of a farm, or some of them were bigger, and they were the center of a larger estate. Okay, estate is just a sort of large farm, I suppose, a farming unit in a sense. Okay, and as I said, you get very large ones uh, and larger estates, and then the villas, the settlement, the uh, buildings in the centre were often uh, more complicated with large courtyards and things. Whereas the smaller ones, uh, the centres of smaller farms, the buildings were in themselves uh, rather smaller and things like that. But uh, all classified as villas following a pattern which we see elsewhere in the Roman world. So what is the person who put this map together perhaps trying to show? What do you think they're trying to prove with this map? They're, he's juxta he or she is juxtaposing, I think it's a he, juxtaposing two different but clearly very similar uh, patterns on top of each other. Early villas and uh, native British uh, coins. Any ideas? You mean the, uh, the map? Yeah, yeah, what does what, what? No, this, this map in itself, okay, contains two sets of information uh, which the we can look at them both separately. I mean, the dotted line uh, indicates where the early villas were. Okay, we'll look at that first. Then we'll look at the, uh, the dots, the, the dotted pattern, and there's some reason for putting them together. So, okay, firstly, distribution of villas constructed before uh, AD 100. Um, what is perhaps interesting about that? Ro villas were Roman in nature. Okay, that's a style that is Roman. Um, if you find, okay, let's pair this back to basics, and maybe refer to our archaeologists here or whatever, or how we interpret things, but um, let me think. Uh, da, 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 da. Here is a board marker, okay? Um, let's say that board markers uh, are a characteristic feature of a particular set of people called the Bill Kent people, okay? And these people, wherever they might live in the world, they always carry a board marker with them or something like that, okay? And the Bill Kent people live over here. This is where the Bill Kent people live, and here is a board marker, and there's probably many of them under the ground for archaeologists to find and so on. However, hundreds of years later, archaeologists will find a board marker over here. Not so many as over there, but a small number of board markers, including this one. They dig it up and say, oh, look, a board marker, okay, which we associate with the Bill Kent culture or whatever. Now, Yeah, 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 okay. Interaction is the key, and then we have to say, well, what do we mean by interaction, I suppose, there? Okay, the simplest format, as you said, is that the Bill Kent people have come over here carrying their board markers and have kind of imposed themselves on this region and, as a result, have left their board markers here or brought the board markers with them. So this is an indication that a Bill Kent person was actually here, okay? Alternatively... 
trade connection, okay? The people over here suddenly said, oh, we really want to have some of those board markers as well. Aren't they really great and we're really jealous or something? Or they give some kind of status. Now, maybe certain members of this community think that by having a board marker in their pocket, Oh, what a great guy he is, or something. So they will exchange things with the people in Bill Kent and say, we will give you, I don't know, vast quantities of grain or something like that. And in exchange, please give us uh, one of your board markers or a few of your board markers or something like that. Um, so it can be physical movement of people, which is reflected by archaeological finds. It can be exchange. It can also mean... Uh, a level of, and this overlaps with the exchange in a sense, a level of shifting um, fashion or trends or whatever. Okay? As we just saw with the slightly more important people in this country, they suddenly have a great desire to have a board marker because it makes them feel somehow better than the other people in their country or whatever. Uh, so there's a certain level of cultural domination perhaps by Bill Kent onto the other uh, we can call that Sabanja, maybe, okay. Uh, the Sabanja people are now being dominated by the Bill Kent people uh, in a cultural way, and to make themselves part of that new world, the Sabanja people, though still independent and not physically conquered by us, but they're perhaps following the trend of having a board marker or something. So what we've got here is an area where we find, before 100, uh, we find um, Roman-style villas, building up. Now, the simplest thing is to say, well, Romans have come, and these Roman guys are not going to live in mud huts like the British. They want to have their uh, own um, villas, the ones they're used to back in Gaul or in Italy or, or wherever. Okay? Um, but as I was saying before, uh, in general, for Roman Britain, we don't see a large demographic movement. We don't see a lot of population shift. So probably, this marks the area in which native British people are the more elite, more powerful, more economically important and land-holding British people are building for themselves Roman-style uh, villas because they feel they are now part of the Roman world in the same way that the Sabanja people, I were arguing, wanted to be part, in a sense, of the Bill Kent culture in that sense as well. So, what these guys would argue is that this line indicates the level of cultural Romanization okay, of the British, and especially the British elite, I suppose we would say. Uh, and outside that area, still by the year AD 100, okay, the Roman presence was a military one, but may not have been a, 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 a totally cultural one as well. This is the core area of Romanization. And then obviously later on, we'll see a spread of that pattern as we go. The fact that it overlaps almost, with a few exceptions, with the areas where we found uh, pre-Roman coins. Okay, coinage was not something which was native to the British uh, Iron Age peoples. It's a thing which they develop uh, in the very late Iron Age, partly kind of imitating what the Romans were doing. So the rulers in these areas were trying to present themselves, like the Sabanja people, with their coins as kind of Roman-style rulers. R rulers, great rulers, the Roman emperor issued coins, and so we have to do the same thing. And so we have these sort of poor imitations that archaeologists are finding uh, in this region here, emanating from uh, these two tribal kingdoms, or whatever we want to call them, in these areas here. Okay? And that indicates a level of contact, of interaction, uh, not uh, necessarily exchange, but some kind of contact or whatever, and so on. Okay? And again, pre-Romanization uh, or something like that, you might argue, and so on. So we could argue that perhaps these areas here uh, were um, already susceptible, already had some exposure to uh, Roman ways uh, for various reasons, and it was naturally in those areas the Romans were able to uh, not only impose their power, but to spread their culture more effectively. The elites of these areas were already willing to take on board some of the Roman-style uh, life living ways. And here we have another map. We can't get it all on. More dots and lines. Compared
comparison of distribution of villas, dashed line shows western boundary of main area. So the villas is the dashed line here. Okay, we're talking about a later period now. And Romano-Celtic temples. Okay, we haven't talked about religion yet, but uh, pagan uh, religious sites that have uh, kind of a mixture of Roman and British uh, elements to them. Okay. Um, Here we see the spread of the villas in a later phase, okay, and beyond this region. These dots here show uh, the Roman British uh, religious sites, but the villas spreading again, interesting enough, creeping into Wales a bit here and into the north, but uh, the, especially in the east and so on. Okay. So again, we can see perhaps the way that uh, the distribution of uh, villas uh, reflects the growing Romanization of parts of Britain. And my last of these distribution maps to share with you is this is place names. Uh, Erzge may or may not have seen this last year. I can't remember if we talked about this one last year. Bring it down. Place names in Britain that incorporate uh, borrowings or incorporate Latin words. Okay, so. Um, Place name derived from which Wickham, okay, which uh, includes the Latin word vicus we mentioned before. Uh, uh, this, this, the cross where place names derived from ecclesia, ecclesia, which means church. Okay, place name containing camp, campus, funta, and port, portus, okay, porta, uh, around here. Now again, the detail, at least from where I sit, is not so great. Now I'm wondering whether we actually might be better off getting a tepe gurs or something set up here. We might get a better resolution for some of my acetates rather than using these. But um, what can we see here? If we look carefully, these are the names which modern onomastic scholars, people who study uh, names, in this case place names, have been able to determine uh, these Latin elements. Latin being the Roman language, of course, reflects some kind of Roman contact. Now what can we uh, perhaps deduce from these? What can we suggest from this, do you think? Language was also Well, yes. Okay. In what way? Develop that. Uh, place names. Uh, bon, uh, I mean, uh, they they started to name um, their um, places of living uh, with uh, Latin um, connotation, Latin words. E elements and things. Yes, I mean, um, uh, okay, two levels of thinking here, I suppose. Uh, firstly. If we're coming along and we've decided we're going to build our village or, or settlement here, okay, here's a nice place. We'll clear the ground a little bit and we're going to build a few houses and maybe in a few uh, years we'll have a small village. We've come here. So we say, okay, what are we going to call this? Now, uh, when we have a new place, they've discovered a new site and they're building a new settlement, uh, people in the past in general will give it a meaning which, uh, a, a name which has some kind of meaning or significance in one way or other. Okay, I mean, look, the, where we are at the very moment, Bill Kent. Okay, it's always said to be a, a combination of Billim and Kent. Okay, Billim Kenty, whatever the city of knowledge, which is an appropriate name for uh, a university, but it has a meaning in the Turkish language, whereas Ankara has no meaning in the Turkish language. And Ankara originally is a much older uh, settlement, and that name has been passed on through a series of conquerors and occupants and so on. When somewhere is set up from scratch, you often give it a name, okay, which usually has a meaning. Okay. My surname, Thornton, presumably my ancestors came from one of the Thorntons in England, and that just means the town, the ton, the settlement, uh, which was very thorny, Diken 
had lots of brambles or sharp things which they had to clear away and so on. And when they finally cleared all these thorny bushes away, they were able to make their first settlement and things like that. Okay. It doesn't mean much today because the ton bit means nothing in modern English, but the thorn in that case we can see. But in many places have lost the meaning. They're just uh, names. But originally they had a significance. They had some kind of a meaning, okay, like Bill Kent, as we said. So if we can find out the original words, it tells us a little bit about the settlement itself, it tells us a little bit about what it was like and so on, and then the fact that those words were living words that people are using and meaning tells us a little bit about the people themselves, what language they were speaking and so on, things like that. Thornton is an English word, it has Anglo old English elements in it, so that, that name was given by early Anglo-Saxons rather than by Welsh people. It doesn't mean anything in Welsh, if you see what I mean. So, as Erzge was saying, we've got these places which have Latin elements, usually mixed, oddly enough, with uh, English elements later on, okay, which might mean a degree of kind of continuity or interaction between people. But it, it suggests that people in this region, and to a lesser extent up the north, there's a little cross up there for uh, uh, Wickham, but primarily here, okay, we see uh, possibility, for example, maybe, that uh, Latin was used on a fairly regular basis, either by uh, the Romans, but perhaps also by uh, the British. And when the Anglo-Saxons came in and took over uh, these settlements, uh, there was a certain level of continuity and interaction. They didn't just kill the people outright and so on. But the interesting thing is that, again, it's the same region. If we look here, okay, it's this kind of region that we saw in particular there. Okay, very similar distribution. The maps are not the same size, unfortunately, but uh, more or less uh, the same area. This area of kind of core Romanization in the first uh, 50 or 60 years after uh, the Roman conquest, the area uh, where we saw the coins also being minted a little bit further south and the extent of that, but very similar as well. So this is a kind of heavily Romanized area. Okay, so this is, to go back to your question earlier, this is cultural uh, domination. So these people become, they feel themselves to be Roman. They Perhaps they will gain Roman citizenship and so on. So unlike people like Boudicca uh, and so on who were rebelling against Roman rule in the early days, within a few, a generation or so, okay, the elites of this southern and or eastern part of what's now uh, England uh, were relatively heavily Romanized, okay, in the ways that they were thinking and behaving and perhaps even speaking and things like that. Well, exactly, yes. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's both, yeah, okay, probably both uh, in a kind of uh, personal way, but also in a practical way as well. I mean, if you want to get on in this society, you behave and act as a Roman, okay? Um, we'll see when we come, for example, look at the uh, Vindolanda tablets that we have uh, one or two instances of a word in Latin for the British people which seems to be a kind of negative one. Those, those terrible, those little wretched, they are how they translate it, the wretched little Britons or something like that, okay. And the people living in this region certainly didn't want to be seen as somehow wretched little Britons. They wanted to be Romans, okay. So that's what's going on here. I think that's what uh, is, is reflected in these, in the way they're living and the way they're creating settlements and things like that. So hopefully what you can see here from these maps, which are not perfectly uh, indicated, shown, I'm afraid, I'll have to rethink that, but what you can see here, I hope, is um, ways in which we can study the past without actually uh, referring to um, uh, written documents, because for this period we have very, very few written documents. These are based upon uh, archaeological finds and place names and things like that, ways of reaching back to the past and reconstructing uh, settlement patterns and population patterns without even necessarily having any direct written sources from the period. A quick note here, as uh, it's a second point, but as I said before, in addition to the villas that we've been focusing on, in North Wales and Northern England, outside the villa area, 
Uh, people uh, continued, obviously, to farm and work the land. They didn't, for a large, to a large extent, live in villas. Uh, they were living in what we call uh, native settlements, many of which uh, were very similar to the kinds of settlements that their uh, British and Celtic ancestors had been living in back in the Iron Age, so there's a great continuity for centuries back. Okay, these were usually enclosures, walled enclosures, okay, often uh, built from um, dry stone, Okay, so they don't have cement holding the stones together. There's piles of, of large stones uh, put around into a wall. Uh, inside, there may have been some kind of a wooden series of structures and so on in which people uh, were uh, living, huts and things like that. Okay, so we have enclosures and then we have some stone and some wooden huts, living places inside, uh, but very small uh, to a large extent, okay, and reaching back, a continuous system reaching back to uh, the pre-Roman times. All right, I'm looking at my watch, and I think we're more or less approaching the time to finish, and I've still got, okay, we can carry on after the break then, so a little bit about religion, and then we'll talk about um, uh, the Vindolanda tablets for the rest of the class. Okay, thank you.